Hi, you're watching Bloomberg Quint. Uh, over the last 48 hours, we've seen SR Oil, one of the leading companies of the SR Group run by the Ruya family, conclude its transaction or the sale of itself uh, to a Russian uh, oil major and a uh, consortium uh, accompanying that. This is a $12.9 billion deal. This marks the entry of Rosneft in India. And it also marks what the SR Group's promoter family, Ruya, have been talking about as an important monetization step in their effort to pay down substantial amounts of debt that the group is currently facing. Uh, joining us to talk about the deal and all the implications, Prashant Ruya. Thank, thank you very you. much, Prashant, thank for you, your time. You. Uh, you know, I think you've already explained many facets of the deal, the size, the importance of the deal to the group, uh, etc., etc. Just a couple of quick details that I wanted to get from you, just to confirm that we have it right. Uh, you have just announced that the outgoing shareholders of SR Oil, these are the public shareholders that participate in the delisting process, will get an additional 75 rupees 48 paise per share as per your agreement with SEBI, which is that you would compensate them from, for the difference you know, between the deal price and the delisting price. How did you arrive at the 75 rupees 48 paise price? Well, it's, um, it's, it's fairly simple. Uh, we, uh, at the time when we did the delisting, we uh, voluntarily uh, offered that right. in case there is a monetization straight after the delisting, the minority shareholders uh, or, the, or the public shareholders would, would get the same price as what we as the majority shareholders would get. In the Rosneft deal. In the Rosneft deal. Right. And uh, even though it's nearly two years since that agreement, we are keeping up our word. Uh, and basically, the additional 75 rupees is this, uh, equates brings the share price to the same price at which we are uh, getting an exit for our shares. So it's the same, it's the same uh, effectively they get both the majority shareholders and the minority shareholders get the same price uh, from Rosneft and uh, Trafigura and UCP are a very important part of this uh, whole, uh, of this whole consortium. Correct. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's what they're going to be paying. That involves an additional payout of about 880 mm, crores. crores yeah. And, uh, within the next two months, within is what the next two months, those are the regulatory requirements. Exactly. Yeah. So, they, okay. so this is this. We're very happy to be to be in a position to be able to do this for uh, for all the shareholders. Okay. I just have a quick question. We did some simple math yesterday. You said the deal is at 12.9 billion, five billion of which was debt. So that left us at about 7.9 billion of equity. When divided by the number of shares outstanding at the time of your deal listing, which is a little over 160 crore shares, uh, it worked out to a 92 rupee differential, or somewhere in the region of that, as opposed to a 75 rupee differential. Uh, what did we not calculate that you have? Why I'm would not, there be a difference in yeah, this? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what is your calculation. Uh, Just this, exactly yeah, this. As yeah, simple but, as this. But uh, the net equity value, what we're getting, is the price which we have announced uh, multiplied by the number of shares. So that's the, that's the, it's simple. So did we get the number of shares I, You may have got the number of shares wrong or I'm not sure what, what your exact calculation is. we looked at the outstanding shares at a little over 160 crore shares at the time of delisting. So I'm just trying I, to. I, 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 so I don't have the, the numbers on the top of my head. Numbers? The net equity value is 7.9 billion. This equates billion. to about 50,000 crores, a market cap effectively for 100% of the shares. Okay, so sorry. So that Excuse me if I'm not computing this as fast as you are, but you've lived with the deal for a year. The net equity value longer. of this deal, a bit longer. <laughs> the net equity value of this deal is 7.9 billion? Yeah, in that range. It, it, it depends so, on the okay, currency. See, I, I it's a, we said it's 50,000 crores. It's there in the press release. It's, if you just go by rupees for a minute, huh. it's 50,400 crores is the net 100% equity value 50,400 crore. Correct. That's what we have announced. What we've also announced is that when SR Oil went public hmm. in 1995, uh, the market cap of the company was 2,000 crores. Hmm. And from that value, hmm. when we are now doing the exit with uh, Rosneft and Trafigura, the market cap is now 50,000. No, that's great. Crores. But 50,400 crores doesn't correspond to, correspond to 7.9 billion. Uh, that's that's the that's, but that's the, the deal that you all described yesterday. This is why, I, in fact, even yesterday I was a little confused when you all made the announcement at the press conference that it's a 12.9 billion dollar deal. Five billion is the debt, and so 7.9 billion, I would imagine, is the equity value of this. What else? It's am a I bit lower than that, up? and uh, it's a bit lower than that. And uh, uh, there's also a minority. There's a 1.7 percent, 1.6, 1.7 percent minority, which you are not calculating. Uh, there are some other many, uh, minor. Uh, calculations and 
we can take you through that. I don't have them off the top of my head right here, but we, my guys have that and we can share that with you. Okay. Uh, but it, but the, trust me, the numbers are... No, of course. Are I'm not suggesting that I this don't a, trust you. I'm done, just trying to get the math right. By, uh, not, and I'll not tell you why I'm going to get, try, and, try and get the math right. Uh, because the process that you went through, which culminated in you confirming to SEBI or you offering SEBI that you will compensate the shareholders for whatever the difference is between the delisting price and the deal, um, I'm just wondering whether the way you've computed this to work out to be a differential of 75 rupees 48 paise it, is open to debate in any fashion, no. which is why I asked you for all the math, saying, where is the confusion here? You announced 12.9 billion yesterday, 5 billion there, 7.9 billion equity. Just, just to clarify, 12.9 is including the port and the power plant. Correct. Yeah. If you remove that, it's actually 10.9 Correct. for SR oil. Right. So I think... There's, there are some assumptions which you are making which are not necessarily the way it is supposed to be calculated. But whatever, huh? but the, whatever money that SR Oil would have SR paid for the port and the power plant would have been part of the value no, of SR not. Oil before but there's also debt which the we are port assuming. and the power plant, right? Yeah. Uh, let me not try and explain the whole thing to you here, but it's, uh, there's also debt which is getting assumed. We... Uh, I mean, as I said, we will get the details and share it. Uh, okay, I'm just wondering if this is likely to be contested. Uh, long, no, I, don't I don't expect so. it to because it's a fairly rich amount. But I'm just saying because the, the numbers here are not all 100% out there. Whatever so. is the share price uh, which we will get is what the minority shareholders will get. And I'm very happy to announce that that amount is 75 rupees more than the delisting price. And that is the same price which we as majority shareholders will get now. The exact math of that is something which we can uh, discuss. I don't have it here and Fair I can enough. share it with you. I would like to get that uh, detail, but we'll do that after the interview. A couple of other quick questions. Is there a non-compete? Is there no non-compete? So is this is... even material? Do you ever intend to get back into the refining business? You do have a standalone refinery in the UK. Will you return to that in India? No, so we have a, uh, we, uh, two, two parts of the oil and gas business uh, continue with us. Yeah, one the is CBM. the coal bed methane. One is the uh, SR Oil UK refinery. That continues. We have a non-compete, which is for three years. Frankly, at this point of time, it's not material because uh, at this point of time, there are no plans to, you know. So it's a standard no compete. It's a standard no compete, which is there. In but the, it's fair for me to assume that at this point in time, you're not thinking about when you're going to set up the no. next refinery no. project. This one in itself was a labor of love, wasn't it? Well, it took it but, took it took its time, yeah. Yes, for a variety of reasons, all very historical, in which we will discuss, you know, some other day when we sit down to do a non-deal conversation. There are some Iran dues in this project. Uh, nobody's actually discussed what the amounts are and whether that liability gets transferred to Rosneft now or how does no, it work. There is a, there is a, as, as is customary in any transaction, there is a true up of the current assets and current liabilities. Hmm. And um, whatever are the current assets and current liability, the net of that, that's also been provided for in the price. And, uh, and, uh, and those liabilities will be paid uh, to uh, Iran shortly. Not by you, by Rosneft, or by Rosneft? No, by that, you? that is our responsibility. That's your responsibility. Absolutely. And what is the amount? It's around $2 billion, 2.1. So you're going to pay this from where? It's part of the, uh, it's part of the uh, sale process. I mean, it's, it's, it, what has been agreed is an enterprise value. Correct. It's less debt and less current assets minus current liabilities. Because that's the way enterprise value is calculated. So... So uh, they're there, paying so you 12.9 billion in that as amount. As EV, as enterprise value. And that amount in com contains that, the 2 billion that you will have to discharge to Iran for the oil supply. Yeah, but the company also has current assets. So the company will receive current assets. The company will pay out its current liabilities. The net of that number is included in the 12.9. Nobody has ever made it so complex before. So what it's is, not, what is not the, complex. Every, what is the quantum of current assets? Marika, please understand, we are not sharing more information than what we have. What, we, what is required to be shared in the public domain has been shared. It's enough data. Uh, every transaction in the world hmm. where, which has an enterprise value. I'm sure has, has current assets and current liabilities. Has current assets and current liabilities. I'm not denying and that. And has debt. I mean, we are not, we are not reinventing valuation no, here. No, we're just wondering why, why the data has been a little sketchy. No, it's not sketchy. Because it's, it's, even it's, yesterday when we asked in the press conference saying, what is the per share acquisition price? Uh, so that we know what the differential would be for your erstwhile public shareholders who, uh, you know, exited during the delisting, uh, there was no number. We were told that, hey, it's still being worked out. And for a deal that's been in the works for over a year now, by your own admission, that was a tough thing to understand. So therefore, I'm asking, where is the I gap here to, in information? I have nothing information? more to offer. Okay. Uh, you said that this $5 billion, no, so you said 4,000 crores 
is going to go towards paying back Indian lenders. Have I understood that correctly? From the, from SR Oil. From SR Oil. Right. Right. And then there are some global lenders as well. Correct. Anyway, you can give me within whatever information restrictions you no, have or you want to share. Can you just give me a simple list of the people you owe money to and who will get that money back? It's, I can't share the whole list with you. Not uh, the whole list, the I'll, short list. But I'll list. give you the numbers. The big it's one. It's very simple. The, uh, the SR global shareholders, hmm. sorry, lenders, will get back 5 billion. That's about 32,000 crores. Hmm. And the, uh, from SR Oil, about 4,000 crores of the debt is getting repaid in cash. The rest of the debt is getting assumed by the new shareholders. Hmm. And the, ad the ad addition of all those three adds up to 70,000. Hmm. And, and those are the numbers. So this 4,000 crores will go to ICIC Bank and Axis? Is that no, the, two, uh, the big, two big lenders? No. Or is Stancy also involved it's in this? The, big, the big lender there is LIC who's okay. getting involved. Uh, I think what you're mixing up is... Yeah, that's what I was a little confused. ICICI, I'm saying Axis, uh, are, are global. they're all global. So uh, Standard share. Chartered, ICICI and Axis and are all lenders to SR Global. And VDB. Yes. Uh, and are they getting paid back? Yes, they're $5 billion. So all of the debt is finished yes. there, hasn't well, paid back? Majority. Majority of it is gone. Majority would be more than 75-80%. More than 90%. More than 90% of the debt owed to Standard Chartered, SR and Axis by SR Global. No, Standard Chartered, Axis no, 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 and... No, no, it's 90% of the bank. debt of SR Global, not individual lenders because the numbers may be slightly different. But majority of the debt of holding company is getting repaid at, with the 5 million. Okay. I'm asking you because I know that in India we're looking at the... The, the bad loan or the non-performing asset problem very, very closely. So this is to suggest that ICICI Bank and Axis uh, will get most of their debt paid back by SR Global. Correct? Uh, this is to suggest that we are repaying $5 billion, of which ICICI and Axis... Why would you not Access, give us a basic because debt I, because, they, because, because we have not done that with any of the lenders, and uh, it's confidential information between us and the lenders. Some of the lenders have come out with their information, ICSA has come out with information which says that they are, we are reducing 50% of our group debt exposure Nobody to them. Nobody given us that a full exposure That number. includes uh, SR Oil and SR Global. What is their group debt exposure? What is their group exposure to, Manika, to these the numbers SR are not something which... But why is it because so... There why is is a, it, because okay. no... Can I no, genuinely ask you, honestly, why is it so... Um, difficult to share this information? Because it is, there, is a, there is a client confidentiality you? between us and the banks. It is not, it's not applicable only to us. It applies to any client. And, to, and there is no, no companies are, or no banks are coming out with individual client bank data. We have given you all the numbers. We have told you who the big shareholders are, I mean the big lenders are. Uh, we've been pretty open about no, it. No, I'm not suggesting you're not open. I've I'm also just said, to understand uh, by the way, in the case of SR Oil, in our press release, huh. we have also said that our major lenders are State Bank of India, Access Bank, Yes Bank and ICICI. It's, it's there in my public. And they will all get most of their debt paid. No, they, they, either they will amounts. get debt repaid or they will get their debt to transferred to the new shareholder. We've okay. been completely open and transparent. No, I'm not suggesting Everybody you is looking for data I'll which is, you, yeah, you know, more no and more harm, information right? which is yeah. not required. Well, look, that's our job. So you must, you're doing what your job is. Our job is to ask questions and ask for data. Lovely. Uh, I'm sure that at many points in time our jobs will conflict. But, uh, so this debt goes to, moves to Rosneft now as the whole and sole owner or at least 98 point whatever percent owner of Rosneft and the consortium right. of SR Oil, right? right exactly. Okay. Right. This monetization effort, as you pointed out, uh, substantial as it is, is not linked to the current challenges you're facing at SR Steel. It's not. So I'm saying that up front before you correct me. And yet, somehow, I'm wondering if you are likely to use this as brownie points to explain to the creditors of SR Steel that we're serious about being able to return the debt. And therefore, in any way, are you hoping this will benefit you because you have been opposing the insolvency process going on in SR Steel? That's my question. So, Marika, uh, firstly, uh, what we have said is that uh, the culmination of this transaction actually helps us deliver our balance sheet significantly and gives us the ability to reinvest in all of our business portfolios. That includes SRST. Hmm. So our ability to invest additional funds, equity or whatever, is required for a, re for a restructuring or a resolution is greater now because, because we have delivered our balance sheet significantly. Right. Uh, as regards the process, uh, 
we were not opposed to the IBC, we were uh, sorry to the NCLT or IBC process. We were already in the middle of a restructuring discussion with the with the Indian lenders, and we felt that uh, the company could have been given the six months which other companies were given to complete their restructuring. Right. In any case, that's in the past now. That chapter is closed. We are in the IBC now, and we will follow the process uh, as as is required in the IBC, which, which, which requires us to uh, re provide a resolution plan which is similar to the restructuring plan which we were earlier talking about. Okay, the restructuring plan that you've been talking about and that is laid out publicly in your petition as well and was argued right. at various courts as well, so I'm using public facts here. Uh, the argument on your end or SR Steel's end was that you were very close to finalizing the restructuring plan. The arguments, if I remember correctly, by some of the lenders in the process who were in court was that that was not the case. Uh, I just want to know where and how you see this resolution process work out in the case of SR Steel. Uh, there are reasons why I'm asking this. I will lead to a bigger picture question on where and how you hope yep. to allocate fresh capital from here onwards in your business. Unfortunately, uh, we are not going to talk about the restructuring now because we, we can't. As we are now in the IBC process. We have to await providing a restructuring plan. Uh, whatever was being talked earlier, frankly, is now a little bit irrelevant because okay. that restructuring process has stopped hmm. and we are now in, in, a, in a fresh process with IBC and we will, we will provide a plan uh, in the future. It's not immediate. It's going to happen uh, as per the timing of the IBC. We will, pr we will provide that plan. There is an interim resolution professional that's been appointed. A credit of, uh, committee Manika. of creditors will be appointed. Manika. No, I'm just recounting for our viewers are, what the steps are. We're here to discuss SR Oil. No, we're here to we're discuss here how to, SR Oil not, will now allow you I'm to not, invest in fresh businesses. I'm not, I'm not going to talk too much more about steel because we are right now in a process. Okay, I will ask which, you one question about which it. Which prevents me. From, in fact, there's nothing really new happening there at this point of time. Uh, it's, we are in the IPC process and then that process is a pretty public process. We will deal with it as it happens. Uh, the, the, okay, word on the street is, again I say this is word on the street, that there are some people that have already approached the interim resolution professional. These are strategic, the buyers with strategic interest for some of the assets of SR Steel that you are likely to put in a competing plan. And the process envisages thus that the resolution professional then picks a resolution plan to present to the committee of creditors who then decide whichever one suits them the best. You stated the process. That, I know. That's, that's exactly the so process. So there are people who are interested or have strategic intent yes. to participate in I, this? I don't know the answer to that question. And if they, are, right? if they are, they're welcome. There's no problem. We, we will provide a resolution plan. Uh, by the way, we've been through this process in the past, uh, even with the earlier, uh, earlier thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, we went through the same process earlier. Uh, and we'll go through it But the now. strategic investor that you spoke of having earlier, which is Farallon Capital, no, no, no. We eventually a... then stepped out because they told us that they were no longer interested in this, right? Menika, I don't want to no? talk too much more about this. I think it's all in the public domain. If other bids come, right. that's, that's part of the process. We will provide our resolution plan. We are confident that we would be in a position to provide a, a better resolution plan. But again, that's something which time will tell. Okay, one last final question on SR Steel. Do you envisage at all losing control of this asset? Uh, right now, there's temporary control loss because of the process. But that's do you a, think effectively a, that might ever be... Uh, a bit of an unfair question. Uh, no? No, because we are, uh, we are in a process now. We will provide a resolution plan. What is going to be the outcome of the process, I cannot for, foresee But you want to today. hold on to SR Steel. Of course, Steel. that's why I'm saying. We're going to put a resolution plan. We have, the, we have sufficient firepower to do that. At one, okay, uh, you told me this in Davos that you did not intend, even at that point when you were looking at strategic players in SR Steel, you said that you intended to hold on to control of the asset. And that is something that you will hope to or desire to do so even in the resolution process. I'm just understanding yeah, the intent. Absolutely. Whatever, we, whatever the, the outcome, the intent is resolution plan we are proposing this. to provide is, is on the strength of SR. Is on the strength of SR, retaining control of that company. Yeah, that's what a resolution plan does. No, a resolution plan could have a variety of different options. You may end up with a minority share. I don't know. And, and trust me, I mean, this is un as untested for us as it is for most other people. So when you say that this allows you to delever your balance sheet and invest in new businesses, what are those businesses? No, it's uh, SR Oil was about 25% of our portfolio. And uh, the rest of the 75% portfolio remains unchanged. So we have been in four sectors. We are in the oil and gas sector. We are in the metals and mining uh, sector. We are in... Uh, infrastructure and we are in services and all the investments which we made in those sectors of which 
we have invested about 1.2 lakh crores in our capital expenditure program in the last uh, four or five years. Uh, all of those assets uh, are the ones which we intend to focus upon. Uh, we intend to grow those businesses. All of them? You, so which, which as, ones as look when, more promising when, right as now? As and when the as and when the opportunities come. So which one? Which uh, ones look more promising uh, so clearly, in this environment? In terms of investment, clearly we would have to make some investment for the steel uh, restructuring. Sure. Uh, we believe the ports portfolio has a huge uh, growth uh, opportunity in India and and uh, overseas. Uh, and uh, uh, in the power portfolio, it's uh, it's it's not an overall uh, investment profile, hmm. but Depending on the individual assets, there are there will be opportunities. Okay, so you've you've identified ports and power, as and of course in oil and gas we continue to invest. We continue to invest in in, upstream. in our uh, we, are, we are as we speak we are investing uh, two hundred fifty million dollars in upgrading the Stanlow refinery. Hmm. Uh, that that investment is currently. You don't want to sell that. I've asked you this question before, to be honest, uh, uh, and I've, you said no because I said what are you going to do with one refinery in the UK, and uh, then you said it. You know we we've said that. Our monetization program is completed, and what that means is that we have completed our monetization program. And what that means is that we are not looking at exiting other investments at this point of time. Okay. Uh, your How much more clearer can I be, Manik? No, but sometimes it's it's good to get people to be assertive <laughs> yeah. about this. Assertive <laughs> about it. That's it. Current port capacity: 92 million tons per annum. Right. Uh, to be scaled up to 190. Yeah, there's gold. a there's a lot of I mentioned. All this is brownfield. You're looking at brown field, green mainly, field. No, no, mainly brownfield. Mainly brownfield. We're brown doing uh, one project in in Mozambique, uh, which is a, a greenfield project. But uh, the principal investments are existing ports growing. Hmm. And uh, as I said, there's a huge opportunity on. In What's the, the port capital sector. outlay for this? Have you already provided for that, or you hope yes, to be we've, able to? We've, we've already. In fact, so the 90 in, to 190. No, not is necessarily all. Of, not necessarily all of it, but uh, a large part of the expansion is already happening right. as we speak. The volumes are. Uh, we, we've been growing our volumes uh, significantly uh, in the ports business over the last two three years. And as these projects get completed, which are all happening now, hmm. uh, you will see significant pickup in the volume. Your outlook on the port business is a good one, I would imagine, Absolutely. given that you listed it as the number one priority right now in the scheme of things, right now. Nothing to do with the the delisting. It's uh, not it's delisting. A, I'm saying now that you, you're, yeah. it's a bit of a re fresh start, right? Exactly. Given that so we believe that ports has potential. We believe our steel business, frankly, has Great a potential. lot of potential. We believe our oil and gas business has potential. Oh, okay. And, uh, and the power, power business and the shipping in, in, business. In, in, no, no, no. In power is uh, not so much growth because uh, thermal-based power plants are, there's not much opportunity to, to invest and grow. But other parts of the power sector uh, hold promise. Okay. So now let me talk about power because you made your plans for ports quite explicit. Uh, the interesting thing in power is in the last two, three years, we've seen uh, a sort of often contradictory situation build up, right? Uh, we saw coal India go from uh, very poor efficiency to great efficiency. Uh, we saw, therefore, the supply of coal improve across the country. Uh, but we've seen a lot of idle power plant capacity. Uh, we've seen the Uday scheme help, or at least make the effort to restructure right. the deadest parts of the, you know, uh, of the power business, which is state discoms. Yeah. Uh, but they're not all necessarily as successful as one, one would have imagined. In the last few months, we have seen state governments and maybe even the central government now wanting to reduce power tariffs to below 4% because many of the auctions in the renewable space four have rupees. arrived at a tariff, 4 rupees, right. have arrived at a tariff of below 4 rupees, right? So weird, no way to tell whether power is working in this country, is it successful, is it a viable business, not a viable business? Can you answer that question? No, it's, uh, I think the real issue in power uh, has been that a lot of new capacity got invested in the last five years. Hmm. Uh, and that new capacity, whether it was gas-based power plants, thermal power plants, uh, and some renewable, a uh, lot of that capacity was invested keeping a certain demand growth in mind. Right. Uh, what has happened is that that capacity has now come, a lot of it, and the demand growth which was expected has not come in the same measure. And therefore, you are seeing a huge surplus uh, power situation. And that surplus power is driving down tariffs to, frankly, uh, unviable levels. Because right. uh, if you if the tariff is around two and a half rupees, that's that's not a tariff which is what the, the public uh, auction tariff price is. Then that's not necessarily a viable tariff for the for the generators. Right. Uh, and this used to be six rupees only a few years ago. So 
because of the oversupply, hmm. it's what has driven these prices down. And this will correct very quickly once the demand for power picks up. And with all the steps the government is taking uh, and the growth which we are seeing, uh, it's a question of time before the power demand picks up. And once that happens, then you will see a lot of this getting corrected. In the meantime, very, very little new capital investment is actually happening. Hmm. So the capacity which is available is what has to be absorbed. Hmm. And, that can happen in, and that can happen once the demand picks up. Ordinarily, I'd agree with you, Prashant, that if there is surplus power and rates are being driven down for future projects, then effectively, and, those, and at those rates, projects are not viable, then effectively that will mean that no future capital will come in, or at least not for the time not period, for the time being. till things balance Correct. out. Right? Unfortunately, I think what many power companies are currently faced with, and several governments have told us this on the record, including the power minister, that there is now an, uh, how do I put it? A nicely polite renegotiation of PPA is happening across the power sector where state governments are uh, asking for already negotiated PPA prices to be brought down to below four because that's what new projects are sometimes offering in the auction. Um, that, that does means, that not render yeah, projects that, that, unviable? No, and does that, that impact you directly in any way? No, it doesn't impact us directly, but that makes it very hard because once you, have a, once you make an investment based on a signed contract, uh, it becomes very difficult and all the assumptions of viability have been made based on that yes. offtake. Then if you, go, if you turn around and change those assumptions, then it becomes very difficult for, for the banks and for the investors to meet those uh, assumptions or meet those viability assumptions. So I, I mean, I don't know exactly where this is, where this is going to head. Hmm. Uh, we have to have a, a sanctity of contract in the country. Uh, we've suffered from some of that. For example, we had a gas supply contract for our steel plant, which was cancelled, and that created a lot of problem for us in the steel business. We are seeing this now in the power, power business. And my personal belief is that if we want a significant future investment, then having sanctity of contract is very, is very crucial for the investors and also, frankly, for the banks. To participate. Why are you all not in, uh, impacted by this at this point in time? No, none of our PPAs uh, have. Are under the pressure to no, be renegotiated no, at this point? Because our PPAs are already below. Uh, Four rupees? Yeah, exactly. So. But you're saying that. So I'm asking you as, as someone who's observing the industry and this trend that we've just discussed, and this could potentially lead to unviable projects or projects going unviable in the industry, as you just pointed out. Uh, and that's not very good news for a country's banking system. That's already laden well, with our, debt. Our at power this minister is on record, uh, you know, voicing his concern over this, and uh, I'm sure they'll find they'll come up with a solution which is uh, best for the industry. Okay, um, shipping uh, prospects are looking good, or yeah, it's a very shipping, deeply cyclical business. Yeah, it's a cyclical business, and for it's us, tough it's, one uh, for the last few it's not a very, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a very small part of of the group, uh, but uh, we we are looking at growing the fleet. Uh, we've recently invested in. In some assets, and uh, but again, it's it's uh, it's largely a long-term charter uh, business, and has been there since 1976. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, and it's uh, it's sort of chugging along. It's not something where where you're going to see huge growth uh, in the future. So the given given the cyclical nature of the of the sector. So in oil and gas, power and ports, that's where the focus is going to be, right? right. And in oil and gas, you're looking at what more upstream assets or no, uh, is, how are you going to hope to yeah, so expand developing, this? Yeah, uh, so developing the blocks we have in Correct. coal bed methane, we develop one of them. Uh, we are now the largest uh, player in coal bed methane. We will look at we have other blocks. One TCF is what you have, right? right? Yeah. And we have three or four other blocks which we can develop, uh, and plus whatever more we can grow the uh, refinery in upgrade the refinery. We're doing retail growth. We are, we are rolling out 400 retail outlets in the UK. Yeah. Uh, we are entering the aviation business there. So, you know, uh, whatever growth uh, can, will come from these assets. It's interesting, is, right? Because you're entering the retail business in the UK and the aviation fuel business in the UK. And we've got all these big players from outside India coming into India to participate in the retail business here. Whether funny. it's BP in alliance with Reliance or now Rosneft. Where intriguingly, BP is a 20% stakeholder. Yeah. Uh, you know, so so we have these large giants coming to India to participate in a business that you are now vacating. That's that's the way the market is. Uh, there are you know, uh, we, we are developing the market because we have a 15% market share in the UK market, hmm. and so we are developing our market there. 
uh, somebody else wants to take a share in India and their current share is zero. And that's yeah. why. No, I just thought it was a curious and observation that and, um, an Indian player is developing the UK market. We've got a big, you know, uh, uh, two global giants coming here to develop the India market. I have two quick questions to close this interview on. Um, because I think you've shared as much detail as possible with us. One is over the last several years, your group has gone decidedly private. Uh, I use the word decidedly because that's exactly what you have done. You have chosen to go private with all of your businesses now. Is there anything left listed? No, we have uh, SR shipping. Still. Only shipping, right? Um, what? Was that because you had lost faith in public markets? Was it because you were in a business where you know things had gotten very unpredictable? Uh, was it that you just found it easier to be privately held? Can you give us no, an explanation I think, why? I think some of the sectors which which we uh, took private. Um, you took everything private. No, it's uh, the, the, we only had three companies. It's not like we had. You Those know, were ten your companies. flagship companies. No, uh, SR Oil uh, was. A labor princi of love. Was principally done. You fought big corporate giants to build that project. Yeah, and and the reason we took took the. The delisting was actually part of the process which we have just culminated. So it was it was actually driven uh, by this process of trying to find a, uh, buyer. a buyer. And and since our public float was very small, uh, that that would be a huge distraction for any for any. But investor. you had a, you had a global company listed on the London Stock Exchange. You went private with that. Again, it was part of the in same the process. Of, yeah, it's, so. it was all part of the same process. So we. Yeah. So what was the big trigger? What was the big reason? For why you decided you went decidedly private? Well, there was no decided uh, decision. Uh, we you took steel depending private, on you took oil dep private, some of the sectors. As I said, there are two parts. Some of the sectors. First of all, our public shareholding wasn't very large, so most of the companies were held 80 percent, 85, uh, 80 percent, or even 75 percent was always held by us, and so the public shareholding was fairly was fairly small, and that in some cases the sectors were really were going through a difficult patch and. Uh, so therefore, therefore, it made sense to to delist, and in in the case of SR Oil, it was a process which was le which led to this, which frankly the shareholders, based on our announcement, they've got the full benefit of that. So, either way, no, it I'm would not have asking remained. this. Okay, so let, to be very clear, I'm not asking this from the point of view of delisting controversies or did public shareholders get the right bit. We've debated that often with you. There will always be several different views out there. Uh, you ran into controversy when you delisted your London company, which was your holding company. Uh, you know, I, I think the rules were changed subsequent to your delisting, I think, if I remember correctly, on the LSE. So, I, the rules you know, were being changed regardless. Okay, Nothing they were being changed regardless. <laughs> Fine. No, so I'm just and curious. There's no controversy. I'll ask you. There's zero controversy post the transaction. I'm sure you don't. Okay, so there I'll ask zero, you the question I, mean, I asked you. None of the shareholders uh, had any issue. Uh, you're not suggesting to me you didn't have trouble with shareholders oh, no. in the process. When you are going through a delisting process, yes. people may have different views. Many questions were but asked once, about but the delisting value at that Once a deal is done well. and once it is settled, when did everybody you list, was happy. When did you list that global company on the London Stock Exchange? 2010. And when did you delist it? Uh, two years ago. So you listed and delisted. and That company stayed listed for what, three years? That's Something nice. changed in the scope of three years. Why would you list a company in 2010? The, the thing which changed was that uh, the way the investors listed. were looking at India, when we were going through a very difficult regulatory process in the power sector, made them made made the the valuation of the company uh, and their ability to invest more funds into the company uh, difficult because they were not. This was in the previous government, in the last two years of the previous government, when we went through huge regulatory problems. And all international investors were worried with their investments, in, especially in those sectors. And so this was a reaction to that, to that uh, event. Okay. Uh, and I don't think it was specific to us. Many, many companies have gone through this problem with international investors during that period of... Some of the resource of, companies did, right? With during Abai, a period, you know, of, yeah. period of time. And that, that was a specific problem that they became, uh, they became uh, uncomfortable with, with what was going on at that time. They are, they are comfortable again now because things have changed now. And uh, there's a lot more transparency today in the policy, which has brought most of the international investors back. And that's why we are here today to announce this transaction. Okay, you're not going to like my use of words, but I'm going to use them nonetheless. You've had 
uh, the Ruya family has had sort of a checkered set of experiences with public markets, right? Whether it was in the early stages of SR Oil, and there might be a variety of reasons for why the project was delayed, uh, or whether it was some of the delisting, you know, sort of uh, related controversies. Um, but do you see yourself maybe in the future, when you invest in new businesses, considering going public or wanting to include public shareholders? Or do you yeah. believe that you would prefer to remain private? No, there's, no, there's no such decision. No such decision? No, no, absolutely not. In fact, if you think, again, if you just talk about SR Oil for a minute, uh, a company which we started 20 years ago with a market cap of 2,000 crores is today getting uh, valued at 50,000 crores. I mean, that's also one of our companies. Yes, we've had difficulties along the way. Lots of them. Any, anybody sure. who's investing in greenfield assets in India goes through those difficulties. And not all times public markets understand those situations. Which is why I'm asking you this so question. That, so if you are in a greenfield project, if the question is, are you, if you are in a greenfield project, would you go to the public? My, I would be, I would think twice. Okay. Because greenfield projects, in, there is a certain amount of inherent risk and public markets don't necessarily understand that risk fully uh, or are willing, to, are, are willing to take that risk fully. However, once you are in an operating business, then it's a different, it's a different uh, ball game. And uh, so we, there is no decision of ours that we are not going to go back to the public market. Or no, I'm not asking for such absolutes. Yeah, so it's I'm the, just it's saying not the at case. some point, did you feel that the public... So this was the answer, I suppose, I was looking for, that maybe not for greenfield projects. Absolutely. Yeah, I think okay. greenfield projects... So that explains is it. Always, and especially when the company's main asset is a greenfield asset, yeah. then sometimes it becomes very difficult. Okay. This is my very last and final question. In the press, press statement that you put out yesterday, uh, when talking about this Rosneft uh, deal... Post-transaction, the group asset base stands at $17 billion. The group revenue is estimated to be at about $15 billion for the That's ongoing true, right. fiscal. Group debt to reduce substantially, but there's no number here. What's the group debt now? As we've, all, we've already said that the 70,000 crores which we have... No, that I know. I read that than, in the other. It's more than 50% of our debt. So obviously the other 50% has to be below 70,000 crores. Right. We've not so gone out with the individual... So you've got about 50 to 60,000 crores yeah, exactly. of debt across right. the various companies right. at this point in time. Right. Of which, if I remember correctly, 40,000 is on SR Steel. Yeah. So the rest of it would, I would imagine, be power yeah. mostly. Yes, exactly. Uh, not that much. There are many it. companies which in the group which are, don't have significant amount of debt. Right. And uh, there are some which, which have uh, debt which are basically asset driven. Right. So again, you might not like how I phrase this question, but somehow in the last several months, Prashant, uh, you know, as India has gone through this cycle of uh, asset uh, heaviness or non-performing assets or um, big corporate loans uh, that have run into trouble because infrastructure projects have run into trouble, um, this question has been posed very often, saying why is it that SR's name keeps coming up on, this, on these lists. Um, is it because There are the not too many, uh, I mean, I don't think it's, it's an issue of where, why is SR come up. SR has come up on this list because we have made big bets in investing in infrastructure projects in India and have faced certain amount of regulatory problems, which probably we had not identified. Uh, many other groups have, have had the same issues as long as they've faced those issues. Other companies who have not faced these issues haven't had issues. For example, in the case of SR Oil, we hmm. didn't have any regulatory problem. We were in a position to complete the project uh, in time, in 2010, the expansion. And we were, we were in a position to create significant amount of value uh, in those assets, as, as many other people have done with their assets. So it's, it's, a, it's a function of which projects got caught in the regulatory No, yeah, but problem. hindsight is a beautiful and, thing, right? So I'm asking you today, as a business leader, when you look back in hindsight, do you think that maybe some of these were not the right bets? Or do you believe that there was no way to tell at that point in time how things would turn out? Uh, because, you know, look, you get mentioned in reports like House of Debt, etc. I'm sure it's not very pleasant. You have your side of the story. Other people have other sides of the story. No, House of Debt and those kind of reports address, they just talk about debt without looking at the assets and without looking about why at, I'm the, asking you the question. at the earnings, right? Um, so I'm not there to comment on, on how other not people that report, look at it. Yeah. But the issue is very simple. Uh, if, if you're looking for a hindsight view, I don't believe that the bets which we took in terms of the assets and the investments were incorrect. Okay. I do believe that some of the risks which came, which we, which we faced, were some things which we could not have uh, foreseen or which nobody could have foreseen. We've learned from that, clearly. Mm. 
And when we go forward, obviously we will be a lot more cautious and a lot more conservative in the way we... In the and way a we, lot more private. And No, I didn't say that. I, I said conservative and... Uh, uh, in cautious. The way, and cautious in the way we look at our future But you continue and you expect that for the foreseeable future, the SR group will continue to bet on infrastructure? That's, our, that's what we... Because you have dabbled with services, like whether it was BPO, yeah. Aegis, all but of our that. Ma majority but of majority of, our, majority of it has of always our, been infrastructure. Majority of our investments has been in these sectors. We have some unique abilities to build and uh, uh, create assets uh, uh, from scratch. Uh, very few people uh, in the country have, have done this uh, successfully. And uh, if we are able to ring fence some of the risks which we have seen in the last four or five years, then, then that's a tremendous asset to have for the future. This is SR 2.0 then? Yeah, I think, I think we've, we've, we've certainly now uh, okay. completed the, the previous phase. And as I said, we are looking at the next phase uh, and we are pretty excited about it. All right. All the best then for All SR right. 2.0. Thank you very Thank much, you. Prashant, Thank for you. a very candid conversation. Uh, that's it here from Bloomberg Quinn. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you visit BloombergQuinn.com if you want more details on this SR Oil Rosneft transaction.